Oh, hello there. Welcome to Glastonbury. Let's begin, shall we? Little did the more intelligent inhabitants of Glastonbury realize what a happy life was lived by their mayor. Matt Decker pitied him for never taking any exercise, beyond his daily walks to and from the shop, and for not smoking a pipe. The young man in the employment pitied him profoundly when they thought of him at all for having no late lady to flirt with, by day and no lady to sleep with by night. Philip Crow pitied him for having no spirit, no initiative, no adventurousness, no river axe, and no airplane. Mrs. Philip Crow pitied him for having no Emma. Emma herself had announced once to Lily Rogers that of all the houses in Gladstonbury, the poor lonely Mr. Wallops was yet in the homeliest she had ever been seen eyes on outside the workhouse. In his dealings with his fellow citizens upon the town council, the mayor held his own very well. He did this by the enormous advantage he possessed over people who believed in the reality of thoughts and feelings. Sometimes when a thief or a liar came into conflict with him, the offender was bewildered by the mayor's penetration. In reality, it was no penetration. It was common sense. But it was common sense of such prodigious proportions as only to confound the victim of its shrewd judgment. Mr. Walp had only once, twice in his life, of sixty years, taken, as they say, to his bed. On these occasions he had been pitied by every gossip in the place. Think poor old gentleman we, his silver whiskers and his girk shimmick, I has no soul to care for him whether he lives or dies. The vicar of Glastonbury had arrived, on one of these occasions, when the patient had a dangerous attack of pneumonia, to play an official call upon the mayor. It was Matt Decker's notion that the hour had come for the man to think of his immortal soul. In place of such thoughts, he found Mr. Walt's placid countenance, his great silver whiskers extended on either side of the pillow, irradiated with absorbed interest in the movement of three wasps upon the ceiling. They keep going round and round, he told the vicar, and the visitor was sadly aware that when he finally uttered the words, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the sick man was still wrapped in interest in these three soulless insects. For two whole days upon the rainstorm that Cordelia had watched beginning for the great oaks of Wicks, I mean, two, two whole days after the rainstorm on the great oaks of Wicks, the rain had fallen almost incessantly. Towards the close of the third day, it began to slow, show signs of clearing off. And about four o'clock, although it was getting so near tea time, Quite a number of people drifted into the draper's shop. Wallops was well known all over the part of Summershire, and the business did not depend upon local patronage, but since the great, quiet, cavernous place had plenty of seats, both against its broad counters and otherwise, there were often quite a number of ladies, who knew one well, another well, chatting together there with their parcels in their hands. Since the old shop did not depend altogether on local trade, Activity at Wallops had the power of languishing without serious loss to its owner. But these idle hours hung heavily on the heads of many of the assistants. The older ones suffered the most. The youngest assistants had so many thoughts of love, thoughts hidden away, in that non-existent world which Mr. Wallop disregarded, and so much to tell each other about these thoughts, that they did not mind these in terms of ebb tides among the customers. The older assistants, and some of them had acquired a peculiar look, the Mary Crow told John Crow was the Wallop's grievance look. Not having love affairs to share, were wont to have the meanest, bitterest, most endurated quarrels among themselves that existed in all Gladstonbury. Mr. Wallop, being occupied with the apparitional world, was certainly not oblivious of these seething recriminations, for Mary's grievance look was quite apparent. But he must have accepted as a mysterious ultimate, just as he accepted the fact that Tor Hill was opposite Charles Hill, and re regarded its cause as belonging to the world of non-existent existences, which a sensible man ruled out of court. On this particular afternoon, Mr. Wallop was seated serenely, as he always was, on a polished swivel chair in a small iron cage. He had brought the cage from a bankrupt bank, in, 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 oops, ah, my hands are so dry.
in Taunton. Oh, Taunton, Mass. No, Taunton, England, I guess. Bought it as an auction for next to nothing. No living persons except the mayor and Bert Cull would have been as much interested in a man cage as in a bird cage. But Mr. Wallop, casting his Bert-like eye around the auction room, had been agreeably stuck by this object and had promptly bought it. That he bought it for no sinister purpose was soon obvious, but the person he put it into, into it was himself. The mayor's shop assistants, especially the younger ones, seemed to have the privilege of wandering all over the place. But once in his cage for the day, the mayor himself never came out except at such times as nature compelled him to do so. His lunch was brought to him in the cage. Well, there's a real obvious metaphor, huh? Close to the great man's retreat, a day or two after Cordelia's visit to Chalice Hill, while in his contentment, contentment, Mr. Wallop was murmuring over his accounts like an amiable sea elephant. There sat on a stool at, once, at one of the counters none other than Mary Crow. She had come to buy a tablecloth for John's room in North Lode Street. As the young man who waited upon her was the young man who had took hair wash for his appearance and Nechke for his conscience, it may be believed that the buying of this simple thing was a slow business. The young man and Mary Crow differed in every point of taste and choice where tablecloths were concerned. Have you heard the news, Miss Ma Mary? These words came from the cage. The mayor was addressing his customer. How do you do, Mr. Wallop? I hope you've been well lately. Some folks in this town, Miss Mary, the voice in the man in the cage went on, are so solicitous for my health that they've decided on my retirement from public life. Pardon me, no, oh no, I don't like that at all. This was addressed to the young man who promptly went off, whistling... Pardon me, Mr. Wallop, did you say your retirement? I don't quite understand. These folks went for me to stop being mayor, explained the cage man. They want for me to turn into a hex mayor. Why, I thought you were mayor for life, Mr. Wallop, cried Mary sympathetically. He shook his head, and then in a lowered voice, bending down towards her so that his forehead touched the bars in his cage. It's that Mr. Geard who's to be the mayor instead of me, so that I can keep my good health unhimpered. Mary had no need to pretend her astonishment at this. She was genuinely amazed. I can't believe it, Mr. Wallop. Surely it isn't true. The councilmen elect the mayor, don't they? They never, never elect Mr. Geard instead of you. That's what they're going to do. I can see it as plain as a map, Miss Mary. But it's a shame. It's a scandalous shame. Why, everybody in Wessex knows the mayor of Glastonbury. Why, weren't you chairman of the grand public meeting when the bishop bought the ruins for the church? It's what they're going to do, Miss Mary. But Cousin Philip is on the council, isn't he? And only as one among the rest, Miss Mary, and although I don't want... He lowered his voice in a, to a penetrating whisper. Though I don't want to be a halarmist. What with his trouble with his workmen and one thing and the other, I'm afraid Miss Crow is not altogether the influence in the borough that he once was. But, Mr. Wallop! She stopped in sudden consideration... Remembering John's close association with Mr. Wallop's rival. But, Mr. Wallop, my cousin John Crow would have told me about this if there had been anything in it. He's working for Mr. Geard now over this tiresome midsummer fair they're getting up, and he's never told me a word. The mayor of Glastonbury permitted a broad smile to flicker across his face. He pulled back his head from the bars and stretched out his cramped legs as far as they could go. People don't tell people everything, Miss Mary, even when they are engaged to be married. The word married came as a second authentic shock to the sympathetic young lady. She had never guessed that the gossip about her and John had gone so far as to reach the ears of the mayor. Obstinately, she returned to the main issue of the discussion. They would never do it. They would never dare do it. The Liberal and the Labor Councilman, Miss Mary, if they vote with these Bolsheviks, eh? Have the majority, if the majority says so, so it has to be. The sleek-haired young man now returned with a great pile of tablecloths over his arm. Mary impulsively got up and, approaching the cage, thrust her arm through the little aperture in front of it. I can only tell you, Mr. Wallop, she said, that whatever John thinks, or is bound now to say he thinks, I shall always think of you as the mayor of Glastonbury. The white whiskers bowed low over the outstretched hand. 
For a second, Mary had the wild fancy that he was going to kiss it. But instead of that, he shook it vigorously. I expect I'll see you next week, Miss Mary, he said. And Mr. F Mrs. Phillips' tea party. Look after Miss Crowell, booty. This remark from his employer had become really necessary, for on her, his, her turn to her seat at the counter, Mary found such an array of highly colored tablecloths, all after the taste of Mr. Booty and none after her own, that her difficulty recommenced with accumulating weight. She bought something at last, however, and nodding to the mayor, walked away from her parcel down the central aisle of the shop. The wall of grievance look had left most of the faces she passed, but the clock was moving round towards closing time, but the smell of the place, that peculiar smell of rent fabric, especially of rent linen fabric, sank into a thin, delicate dust into her nostrils, into her throat, into her consciousness. I'm glad I don't work here yet, she thought, but if Miss Drew turns me out, when I'm married to John, I swear I'll ask that old chap to let me come to him. I could sell tablecloths anyway better than that conceited boy. Once on the pavement, she hesitated as to whether she had time to take John's tablecloth to his room in North Lone Street before returning to tea with Miss Drew. Pondering on this point, she remained in front of Wallop's shop, staring into the window. It happened that the light fell in such a way upon the window glass as to throw back a reflection of her face. Mary was startled in its apparent paler and its haggardness. How many weeks has she been looking like that? Girls ought not to have anything to do with what they're in when they're in love, she thought. They ought to be left off ex everything. She turned away now from her reflection in the shop window. I'll just leave this parcel with the landlady, she said to herself. John was not expecting to see her today at all. She assumed it was spending all his time today with Mr. Geard. No, I won't get up those stairs, she thought. I'll leave this with the woman. She hurried down the street, turned to the right by St. John's Church, followed the railings of the cattle market, turned to the left down Georgia Street, and finally arrived at the door of number 15, North Lode. She could not find the landlady. Always present when she would have given anything for the woman not to be there, today when she wanted her she was nowhere to be seen, nor were there any neighbors around. Over the hall of number 15 hung a sinister and unnatural silence. The street doors were wide open, and just inside it was the landlady's door, but all was silent, forbidding, desolate. Three times she rang the bell. Not a sound. She went back upon the doorstep and rang the other bell. The outside bell. Not a sound. Well, I'm just run up and leave it outside, she said to herself, and began descending the stairs. What was her astonishment when she heard the voice up there while she paused to take break on the first landing? At the top of the second flight, she could catch actual words. She stopped there hesitating. Yes! He had someone in there with him, and she knew who it was, too. It was Tom Barter. She stood for a second, resting herself, with her parcel propped upon the balustrade. She did not pause there to listen. She paused because she felt unable to enter, and equally unable to go away. It was one of the most wretched moments of her life in these last agitating weeks. I'm going to make a little money, she heard Carter say. And then I'm going to clear out. That was what Mary and I used to do all the time when we were so thick. We used to curse these superstitions. Your precious boss, Geard, is the greatest humbug of all. But of course you know that. You're only out for making a little money, just as I am. And then, holy Moses, you'll be a bunk just as I shall. There was a sound of shuffled chairs and the clatter of china. Mary Crow became suddenly conscious that her attitude to Glastonbury had changed of late. It was Tom Barter she hated now, not Glastonbury. John's voice uttered the next words, and they did not improve matters. Where on earth has she put my whiskey? She heard him cry. Oh, I wish to God women wouldn't always tidy things up. Then came Barter's voice again. As far as she could catch his words, he seemed to be criticizing John's biscuits. Those Huntley and Palmer biscuits that she had bought with such care a week ago. It's just as if he were a rough and tumble undergraduate's room in Oxford, she thought. Yes, Tom was criticizing her biscuits. He was stretching her rug with them too, no doubt, and trampling them into it. They had now apparently found the whiskey and were hunting for glasses. Then ensued more chatter and more half-humorous and half-peevish groans. Then when they had seated themselves again, 
still worse ensued. And that worse ensuing, we'll have to save for next time. And so, until next time, I'll see you in Gladstonebury. Cheers.